So the 3D printer itself is 80 feet long by 25 feet wide and 10 feet high. So it enables us to 3D print a boat hull. Those guys blew my mind. I'm ready to sign up. Nick, what do you say? I feel a like I'm in the special forces or something. I got my full kit, the full backpack on, gimbal, 360 camera, mini vlogging camera, big cameras, uh, drone. We're ready for battle. You look like you're in the special forces. <laughs> We're on the east coast of Australia. We knew they liked their boats down here, but the boat works, it's just downright impressive. Dozens and dozens of big boat sheds, and it's all new and eco-friendly. All the services right there too. We were there to look at a catamaran for sale, and this one looked to fit the bill. Sorry for the blurred out image, but once again, the owner did not want his boat photographed or put on social media. But it's really too bad. This boat was beautiful, in fantastic condition. Only problem for us is the headroom. Who knew being six foot two would be such a problem on so many boats? But it wasn't a wasted trip. We got to hang out with our friends, Jason and Claudia. They have a YouTube channel too. You should check them out. Jason is from Australia and he is wired in. He comes from a boat building family and knows all the players. Took us to see this fabulous custom carbon build in for refit. Now with our budget, we might be able to afford the Longeron and maybe the mast. But it lit the fire for us. Maybe we need to start looking at something a little more high tech and possibly more expensive. The invite from Cure Marine to check out their factory and their new 55 just getting underway was perfect timing. They're just moving it off the drawing board and into the boat shed. And they are riding a wave that is sweeping through the catamaran building industry. Yeah, I think I think the benefit here is that, you know, we're we're starting a new production process and using manufacturing 4.0 technologies. You know, so we're not having to change existing methodologies to bring them up to standard. We're starting right at the forefront design, design and manufacturer and using the state-of-the-art equipment. So the 3D printer itself is 80 feet long um, by 25 feet wide and 10 feet high. So it enables us to 3D print a boat hull, basically. It has the 3D printing head. It also has a machining head that can come up and clean up um, our shape after that process and then a sanding polishing head as well to get that you know, sort of gloss finish on our, on our molds. The, the process of uh, taking the design to a finished hull, so it starts with your, your design obviously, and, and what, what we'll be using the printer for here is for printing uh, the form, the plug, which we then take a, a mold off of. Um, so after we print a plug, we can actually go and chop that back up again and reuse the material. So it saves a lot of wastage and things. Now, I don't think this is a complete shift away from traditional, more manual labor intensive methods of creating tooling, but an integration of new methods that are automated. Like laying up what you see back down in the other factory where you're putting all the ply down and sanding it back and making it, you know, you can, you can imagine how much more accurate you can get it. You know, so once we get these um, molds kind of ready to go, then we're, we've got, um, Tyler does a whole lot of 3D scanning on them to make sure it's all right down to the, to what, to what kind of uh, specification, mate. Yeah, like, um, zero, zero point one or, or zero, depends on the application, but for a boat, typically like zero point, zero point five would be, would be pretty good to zero point one. Yep. Millimeters. Yeah, yeah, sorry, mi mi millimeters. Wow. Yeah. That's very tight. Yeah, yeah. Higher tolerances are better. Of course, right? Well, I'm going to try and explain why that's such a big deal, especially when it comes to building with carbon fiber. You see those smooth, smooth surfaces. Well, it takes a lot of work to get that mirror finish. With a fiberglass boat, you've got gel coat, and that offers the builder a lot of latitude for mess ups. But on a carbon fiber boat, that laminate is laid up right against the mold. The slightest imperfections or bubbles show right up in the hull. So to get that mirror smooth finish, a carbon fiber boat needs filler. All the pink stuff you see 
is filler. It's unavoidable to some extent, but the downsides of using too much filler is that it takes a lot longer to work with, more labor and more expense, and also a lot more weight. So the less filler you can use, the better. So the folks at Cure Marine are going the way that Gunboat and Ultramare have gone. They're automating. What is this piece right here? This is our, our laminate cutter. So a CNC machine that cuts all of our, our cloths and fiber. What happens is the, the glass or carbon comes off the machine so fast that someone has to stay there and roll it up as it, as it comes off. It goes into this uh, what we call Kanban system. Each part has a, a name associated with the particular mold or layer. Um, so it goes on the shelf, then the uh, operator or the technician will know what bits of carbon or glass to get and then go and apply them to the, the part. The big structures in a catamaran are foam cord, meaning you've got carbon or fiberglass on the inside and outside and foam in the middle. On, on this machine here we've got a, like a beveled edge that goes into quite a complex mold. So it's a really prime example of how we're, we're reducing the amount of manual labor and in, increasing accuracy because that foam gets, uh, gets machined and then it goes straight into the mold. Whereas, uh, you know, in the, in the olden days, you'd have a sheet of foam and you'd have to cut it out and manually place it. Because with, with composite materials, it's all those different pieces that we're looking at. It's, it's like the foam, it's the glass, and the more accurate each of those stages is, the, the better. That's so many voids. Yeah no, yeah, no voids. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Less material. Yeah, yeah. That foam is calibrated to uh, fit into a mold at the exact glass thickness. So there's really no, we've taken out the opportunity for for voids when we infuse. Yeah, we actually, uh, we resin infuse most of our parts and uh, we also silicon bag, which is where we, instead of making a new bag every time, the guys don't have to um, lay out and cut the bag every time. And then of course, um, so reusable, and also we're not wasting plastic every time. So it's, it's like a four hour time save per, per part at least, yeah. 3D printing is no longer the realm of hobbyists. This is big industry. The benefit of the 3D printing and the robots is that we can um, take those man hours out so we've got all that skilled labour being um, taken away to other industries or just in general in the broader uh, market it's harder to get labour. That's what enables us to bring these boats in at, um, at such good weights and such good prices. Okay, let's talk dollars. How about that price tag? 1.6 mil US and that is a lot of money. But Comparing to the competition, it's actually a lot lower than you'll find for Balance or HH, boats of a similar size. But it's somewhat similar to Ultramare, who has a similar 55-footer. What we see now is obviously with H&H &H and Ultramare, we're seeing a, an elongation in actual lead times that we're looking to exploit. I mean, <laughs> we're hoping that, well, we know that our product's gonna be good enough to go into the market and deliver in a more timely manner than some of our competitors. Um, so I don't think we, we're probably off the back of the slowdown. We're hoping to benefit from that. It's a really long road from vision to design to floating masterpiece. It's exciting to think that technological innovations could provide some shortcuts to deliver better boats at hopefully better prices. We should know pretty soon. Cure says they'll have two boats floating by the end of 23. I love doing stories where I learn something and this term industry 4.0, the move from manual labor to, I guess, automated end-to-end -end manufacturing is fascinating. I know there's a lot of doom and gloom out there in the economy, but things like this could really change the way we get products delivered. Before we head out sailing, one more word on carbon fiber. It's not actually our first choice for a building material. It's very stiff and strong, but you gotta take pretty good care of it. What are the special considerations people need to think about when having a carbon boat? We need to strengthen areas that might be prone to impact or like for example, the anchor um, coming on board. We're gonna have some you know, protection plates and things around areas like that. Um, to make sure you don't damage that carbon structure. And do you have to be real careful with different metals touching carbon or? 
Yes, yep. Um, so there is some you know, galvanic corrosion that happens with that. Um, so isolating those and you know, keeping them separate is important too, absolutely. And that's pretty easy to do just as you're building it? To... Yeah, as long as you, you know, you're aware of it and you can um, design that into your manufacturing process and your build. I gotta tell you, I didn't know what to expect at Cure Marine, but those guys blew my mind. I'm ready to sign up. Nick, what do you say? I was super impressed with that facility. I mean, they, they really are looking towards the future of bow building. And we're actually gonna go out on one of their previous builds. It's a Shoning G-Force. I might be getting this wrong, but I believe it's 18 meters, so pushing 60 feet. So this thing should be really, really fast. The name is Zero, and I gotta ask the owner why that name. Why Zero? Zero, what's the significance of Zero? Well, Gary Crick was the guy that named it. He, he owned it before me. Um, he reckons he called it Zero because he'd have Zero in the bank when he was finished. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. But... I was really curious to sail this Shoning. The last time I sailed one, I got seasick. And I'm not even prone to seasickness. This time around, it was like riding in a Cadillac. A convertible Cadillac. Oh, how the skinny holes slice. Performance boats are faster, of course, but they're also more comfortable, especially when you get into lumpy seas. Well, a guy said to me, I, I felt it was too big, but a guy said to me, everything is, every boat is too big in the marina and every boat is too small out there. So, yeah, so right. once, once you do a few trips offshore and this, you just, it's just awesome. It's just so, now that 60 foot water line it just smooths everything out. I was going to say this boat is nimble for its size, but it's just plain nimble. It really turns pretty quick. And we actually didn't see a winch handle all day. Everything is electric. I can drive this on the cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. I just said it's easy to be an electrician. <laughs> I'm an old electrician. Pretty nice, isn't it? Good, good conditions. There's double black diamond. Uh, that's a oh. that's a Stephen eleven fifty. Okay. <laughs> See the seaman with the destroying bows. Yeah. We're going to be sailing a sister ship of this boat up in the Whit Sundays over the next couple of weeks. Looking forward to that. I've been really paying attention to rigging on these various performance boats we've been looking at. This one's got two powered winches, four to the mast. One I believe is for the halyards, and the other one works the self-tacking jib. It's a very efficient layout. You know, you can easily sit on 15 knots. You can sit on whatever speed you want, up to 20 knots, basically. Yeah. Now, did you uh, did you have pros with you at first to help figure it out, or did you just um, hop straight on, or what? Oh, we hop straight on. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had pros. With <laughs> now we got when I bought. Well, three months after I got it, the sails blew out. They delaminated, so we had to get new sails. Yeah. So we ordered these North 3DI sails. Yeah, yeah. North are really good. They they came out and gave me lessons, and we actually had one of the guys at Hamilton Island Race Week with us. Um, Tuning the rig, basically, yeah, it's, it's, um... What laminates did you have before? Doyle sails before. We, we've had their Stratus. 
Uh, that's what we had. Straight. And they ripped up. They delaminated it. The so main, almost all at the once. Uh, no, at the top and worked down. Yeah. It was almost like the glue had its reached its use by day. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I, the Doyle sales were awesome, but they just didn't last the distance. And, I, and when I rang Doyle, they just said, that's what happens. <laughs> How old were they? Uh, probably about six years old and that all happened. I'm not saying these will last any longer, but I hope they do. The North Sales are wickedly expensive and they convinced me that I, to do the boat, boat justice, I had to buy these sails. Now I find I've got Aramid rigs, so that should be replaced about now. And oh, really? So they're okay. telling me I should get carbon to justify the boat, but carbon rig starts at about $65,000. I'm, I'm struggling to justify that. 13 and a half knots in 14 and a half knots of wind. Not bad. My happy place. It's really easy to make it all about the boat, the thing. But I don't think that's what it's all about, actually. For me, it's about learning, seeing new things. Gaining experience from other people who know. You wouldn't have known it, but we're racing today and smoke the field. But as everybody rounds the last mark and heads for home, a nice peaceful relaxation settles in. And no matter where we are, boat size or skill level, it's about learning and iterating, building up that knowledge and skills base. There's really no substitute for experience. Spending time on zero was really helpful to me. I've been battling this helm position thing in my mind for, well, months or maybe even years. And I've, I've always felt that the outboard helm situation just was not right. But the more time I spend on performance boats, the more time I realize it's best to have a good view of the sails from either side of the boat. So yeah, I could be an outboard helm convert. Don't get us wrong, the fully enclosed helm position is awesome. But if you're fully enclosed, it's impossible to see the entire sail plan. Well said. Every boat we get on, whether it's to sail or to possibly buy, we gain valuable experience. Same goes for the people that we meet along the way, whether it's the skipper of the boat or in the case of Cure Marine, all these brilliant engineers trying to put together a new process for building a boat. It's really incredible to learn from them. Everywhere we go, we meet fantastic people, including in Australia. And we've met some fantastic people who've really helped us out here in the Brisbane area. Dave and Nanny, thank you so much for picking us up at the airport and giving us your car for the week. That was amazing. Also, we're on a Helio 44. Thank you so much, Steve and Jane, for hosting us and making us feel at home. And a big thank you to the patrons. Without you, none of this would be possible. Thanks everybody for spending your valuable time with us. See you next time. Bye-bye.